Hey guys, if you're watching this video, there's a really good chance that you know I am a high school mathematics teacher. Uh, and you may even have seen enough of my videos to know that being a high school mathematics teacher means I have high school mathematics students that I teach. And I do all the regular things with my students that every other teacher does, include give my students assessment tasks. And what you're about to see is the result, it's the submission for an assessment task that I gave to some of my students who study something called Year 12 Mathematics Extension 2. It's a really high level of of sophisticated mathematics and one of the cool things we get to do as an internal school assessment is give students the chance to explore different levels and areas of mathematics that attach to the things we explicitly teach in class uh, but aren't necessarily things that we have directly shown them but sort of connect and that they can explore and understand using the knowledge that we've helped them develop. So this is a particular student of mine whose um, submission, his uh, assignment I'm particularly proud of. I think you guys will enjoy it. So have fun and I don't want to say anything to spoil the video because it's got uh, a very clever kind of twist in it uh, but I hope you guys like what you see and learn something from it. From a bad hair day to a tragic natural disaster, wind can be extremely disruptive. But what if wind didn't exist? Would airplanes still fly? Can birds still fly? Well, what if I tell you that there is always at least one place on earth where there is no wind? In this video, we'll be going through the concept of Euler's characteristic and the Poincaré-Hopf theorem, and we'll be combining all of that into another known theorem to understand why there exists a place without wind. Firstly, we must understand what a convex polyhedron is. A convex polyhedron is simply a polyhedron for which a line connecting any two points on the surface always lies in the interior of the polyhedron. This refers to a relationship known as Euler's characteristic. Euler's characteristic tells us that for any convex polyhedron, the vertices minus edges plus faces is always equal to 2. Let's have a look at an example. Consider the following. A tetrahedron has 4 vertices, 6 edges, and 4 faces. A cube has 8 vertices, 12 edges, and 6 faces and an octahedron has 6 vertices, 12 edges, and 8 faces. Now applying Euler's characteristic, by subtracting the edges from the vertices and summing the faces, they all equal to 2. Similarly, this would be the result for any convex polyhedra. But does this still hold true for a sphere? After all, we are trying to find a place on Earth with no wind, and Earth is a sphere. So let's consider a sphere passing through the origin with radius 1 with the xy, yz and the xz planes showing. We can see that as the respective planes cut across the sphere, we actually have 6 vertices, 12 edges and 8 faces. And so Euler's characteristic for a sphere also equals to 2. But what does this have to do with wind? Well, before moving forward, Let's see if we can prove that Euler's characteristic is true for all convex polyhedra, as this will help to complete our final proof later on. In doing so, we need to address some key definitions. We can reframe the idea of a convex polyhedra in terms of planar graphs. Now, if we draw a set of dots and connect them with lines between them, this is known as a graph. Now, if the lines don't intersect, this is known as a planar graph and a planar graph is connected if there is a path between every pair of vertex. So let's consider a path starting on any vertex on a planar graph that later returns to the same starting vertex. This is called a cycle. And a planar graph without any cycles is known as a tree. We must know that a tree has only one face, which is the entire plane surrounding it. So Euler's characteristic reduces to vertices minus edges equals 1, which is just edges equals vertices minus 1. Now, to finally prove Euler's characteristic, there are many ways to do so, but we'll consider the approach using the number of edges. Before we start off our proof, let V be the number of vertices, E be the number of edges, and F be the number of faces in a planar graph G. Step 1 prove true for our base case. Well, our base case occurs when edges is equal to zero. So when edges is equal to zero, 
the graph consists of a single vertex with a single region surrounding it. So that means that our Euler's characteristic just becomes 1 minus 0 plus 1, which is equal to 2, which is our right hand side. So the formula holds true for our base case. Moving on to step 2, our inductive hypothesis. We'll assume that the theorem is true for all connected planar graphs with E-1 edges. And moving on to step 3, we must consider two cases for our connected planar graph. Our first case is when our graph G does not contain a cycle. So if G does not contain a cycle, then G must be a tree, and we know that trees only have one face, which is the entire plane surrounding it. So referring back to our definitions, we actually now have V minus 1 edges. So our value for Euler's characteristic just becomes V minus brackets V minus 1 plus 1, which reduces to 2. So the formula holds true for our first case. Now moving on to case 2, when G contains at least one cycle C. So let's consider this cycle shown below. Now if we remove an edge from the cycle C, this means that it doesn't remain a cycle anymore, as the trail doesn't end at the starting vertex. So this is simply a path P. Now our aim is to apply the inductive hypothesis to this new graph but our assumption was only true for connected planar graphs. So if we remove an edge from our cycle C, then won't our graph become disconnected? Well, not really, because there still exists a path between every pair of vertex. Therefore, our new graph has the same V vertices and now has E-1 edges. But how about the number of faces? Well, initially, our graph G had faces F1 and F2, but after removing the edge P, the faces F1 and F2 combined into one face. So generally, our new graph will have F-1 faces. Hence, by the inductive hypothesis, the theorem must hold true for our new graph G without the edge P. And by substituting our values and simplifying, we can actually see that it does in fact equal to 2. Thus, by the principle of mathematical induction, Euler's characteristic for all convex polyhedra is always equal to 2. However, we must note that this is only one case of Euler's characteristic where it is equal to 2. Other surfaces, such as a ring or a double torus, will have other Euler characteristic values. So, to simplify this idea, if you take something with an Euler's characteristic of, let's say, 2, and morph it into something else through continuous bending and stretching without tearing, then the Euler characteristic will remain 2. Hence, surfaces with the same Euler characteristic are said to be homeomorphic. Two surfaces are homeomorphic if we can get one surface from the other by stretching and bending the surface as if it was made from a piece of clay. Now that we understand the basic principle behind the Euler characteristic, let's consider this ring, which is better known as a torus. This has an Euler characteristic of zero. Instead of trying to compute the Euler characteristic for a torus, we can actually use a planar model to study the surface more easily. Consider the construction of a torus as shown here. Considering this rectangle, the rectangle has four vertices, but in the planar model of the torus, every vertex is actually the same vertex, labelled V. Hence, there is only one vertex on a torus. The rectangle has four edges as well, but in the planar model, edges E1 and E1 stick together to become the same edge on the torus, and the same applies for the edge E2, and the total number of faces remain 1. Hence, the Euler characteristic for our torus is 1 minus 2 plus 1 
which is zero. This may seem like a lot, but bear with me. All of this will contribute to our final proof later on. Now moving on from Euler's characteristic, let's consider a world based on a torus with a constant wind blowing around the world. This constant wind can be represented by a vector field. A vector field is used to model the speed and direction of a moving fluid, represented as a collection of individual vectors. Now, if we begin to slowly close the hole, we are eventually left with a zero vector, meaning that there's no wind. Viewing this from an alternate perspective, we are actually just observing a sphere and there are in fact two zero vectors now. This means that a sphere has two points where there is no wind and the torus had zero points. Linking this back to our previous concept, the sphere had an Euler characteristic of two whilst the torus had an Euler characteristic of zero. So what's going on? Well, this has to do with French mathematician Henry Poincaré and German mathematician Heinz Hopf's whose contributions led to the Poincaré-Hopf theorem. The Poincaré-Hopf theorem states that for a continuous vector field on the surface, the sum of the indices at every point where the vector field is zero is equal to the Euler characteristic of that surface. To understand what this means, we need to consider the different ways in which a vector field can be zero. Here are some examples where we have a zero vector present. Now each of these vector fields has an index, otherwise known as a winding number. So let's take a look at our first example. We'll place a hypothetical vector on the surface of the field and it to face in the direction of a vector in that region. We'll then move this hypothetical vector anti-clockwise along the surface, whilst maintaining its direction in terms of a vector in that region. In this scenario, the vector results in one anti-clockwise rotation and hence this vector field with a zero vector has an index of plus one. Similarly, let's consider this example. Just like before, we're going to place an imaginary vector on the surface, pointing it in the direction of a vector at that point. As it moves along the surface, it also makes an anti-clockwise rotation and hence it has an index of plus one. But how about this vector field? Following the same process as before, instead of the imaginary vector making an anti-clockwise rotation, it actually ends up making a clockwise rotation. Thus, this vector field with a zero vector has an index of minus one. Now, let's go back to our sphere. From earlier on, we know that the sphere has two zero vectors, one at the top and one at the bottom. If we zoom onto those two zero vectors, we can see that both vector fields have an index of plus one. And we also know that a sphere has an Euler characteristic of two. Thus, the Poincaré-Hopf theorem holds true, as the sum of the indices at every point where the vector field is zero, which in our case is plus two, is equal to the Euler characteristic of that surface, which again is plus two. Therefore, coming back to our world built on a torus, we actually have a vector field that is non-zero everywhere, as the Euler characteristic for a torus is zero. Hence, as we know that the Poincaré-Hopf theorem always holds true, we can conclude that for any sphere with a continuous tangent vector field, there must always be at least one zero vector, such as the example shown here, which has an index of plus two. And this actually ties into our main theorem as to why there is a place on Earth with no wind, which is officially known as the Harry Ball theorem. Why is it called that, you ask? Well, simple explanation. Essentially, the theorem proposes that you can't comb a ball of hair without having some hair sticking up. And since wind on Earth is like a projection of hair on a ball, this theorem implies that there is always a place with no wind whilst the actual proof of this theorem is way beyond the scope of this course, we can actually simplify this proof using a method from our nature of proof topic, which beautifully integrates the concepts of both Euler's characteristic and the Poincaré-Hopf theorem. Just like starting any other proof, we'll first find our implication, 
If there exists a sphere with a continuous tangent vector field, then there must be at least one zero vector. Moving on, we'll assume that there is a continuous tangent vector field on a sphere, which is non-zero everywhere. Therefore, according to our assumption, the Euler characteristic of a sphere must be equal to zero. However, remembering back to what the Poincaré-Hopf theorem said, the sum of the indices at every point where the vector field is zero is equal to the Euler characteristic of that surface. So by considering the sum of the indices, it actually adds up to plus two. And hence, our Euler characteristic should be two as well. And this leads to a contradiction, as the two values of the Euler characteristic do not match. Thus, a non-zero vector field cannot exist. It must be zero somewhere. And there we have it. There must always be at least one place on Earth where there is no wind. But hold up, we have focused on one application of the Harry Ball theorem so far, but it doesn't really end here. There are actually many more real-world situations that act like Harry Balls. In early 2007, scientists from an engineering team employed the Harry Ball theorem to nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is a field of research concerned about building things on the scale of atoms and molecules. What they did is that they covered gold nanoparticles with monolayers, which essentially made it into tiny fur balls. As a result of the theorem, the scientists knew that at any given point, there would always be some hair standing from the surface, even if there would be only one. This always allowed for the nanoparticles to attach themselves to each other in any circumstance. This was a breakthrough for scientists, as it was mentioned that it may open a new avenue for using nanoparticles due to its new functionality. And the best part is, is that the theorem is not only limited to what it is, it extends way beyond the idea of wind on earth and nanotechnology, and really makes us appreciate the beautiful nature of mathematics in our world.